Hello chess family, it's time again for another lesson. It's me, National Master Jesse James Lozano, and today we're going to be going over one of my favorite positional games with Rubenstein versus Slaw. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Now this is a very good game to learn about what's called square control, uh, where we actually look at a very important square in the game and we have to, and if we can actually control the square, we're either going to be winning or we're going to be hold, holding the position. In this game, we're going to be learning about a very important square that Rubenstein controls, and after that, the game becomes very simple to win. Well, at least simple for a, a player of such high, high level. So let's go ahead and get started with this game. We're going to be starting off with d4, d5, pawn to c4, pawn to e6. Looks like we're going to be playing into a um, queen's gambit. And after knight c3, black surprises, surprises us with pawn c5. Hopefully you know the name of this opening. This is called the Taras Defense. Now at the highest level, this is not very well respected because already white can force what's called the isolated pawn. Actually, can you see, what does white play here to force the isolated pawn? After this, white's gonna get a nice little advantage that, well, black just cannot keep up with. So what do you play here? Hopefully you found it. You just play the simple move C takes D5. And after this, black is pretty much forced to take back. And now at any moment, we can try to play the D takes C5 ideas. Um, we don't want to do this right now as it'll just help develop the piece, so we just keep developing normally with knight to f3. I do want to point out here, if you are looking at this pawn move of c4, let's say after knight f3, and then c4 gets played, well, this is going to be a very bad idea. White has a few good moves here, one of them being b3, which is very common anytime they push these pawns forward. After pawn takes back, you can do queen takes b3 or even a takes b3 to get a good, good, good game. And here you can see that, you know, this is isolated and white will have an open file here or open file here for your rook. Another very strong move that we can play here is this pawn to e4, just going out for the attack right away. So c4, or c5 played, vice versa, is not too good in these, in these lines. So after knight f3, black continues with knight f6. And now a very important move here for white. What pawn structure are you going to choose to play for yourself? We know our opponent is going to be playing into this isolated pawn as black, and so it's important that we know what is the best plan for isolated pawns. Well, hopefully you know. Whenever your opponent has isolated pawn, here black will have the isolated pawn, the best thing to do is to attack. Because your pawn structure is not too good, a long-term game of strategy will not be the best decision for you. But when you have the isolated pawn, you have more central control. Why, why is that? Well, not that white's going to play this right now, but just for uh, demonstration purposes, if d takes c5, bishop takes c5, you can see here that black now has more central control because he has the only pawn. Now white's going to try and win this pawn by attacking it and hopefully going to a, an end game. The king and pawn end game should be a win here for white. Of course, it's still a lot of middle game and black is going to try their best to stop that, right? They're going to go for that attack. So knowing that your opponent needs to attack and white would love an end game, what should we play here? Think about your development of your pieces. Here, one of the best ways to play this is to play pawn g3 going into the fianchetto. Why is this a good idea? Well, first of all, attacking fianchettos is already very, very hard. Um, if you think about a lot of these dragon variations or king's indians, the attacking a, a fianchetto is just difficult because you've got a lot of pieces to defend. you got a bishop and the knight, just not the knight alone. Another good reason why you would want a fianchetto against this isolated pawn is because, well, when you put your bishop to g2, it's already attacking this weak pawn right there. Remember, it's the d5, it's the isolated pawn. So this is a very good practical decision for Rubenstein, and definitely the best. Let's continue. Knight c6 gets played, bishop g2, and now if black plays the, the, the common move, which is to play something like bishop to d6, well, here we just have the simple idea, we can just play d takes c5. This is a common rule in a lot of these lines. Anytime the bishop comes out, we, then we're going to go ahead and take. It's like a, a queen's gambit, if you will. So the same piece will move twice. Black didn't want to deal with this, so he plays a trickier move. He plays c takes d4. Of course, we play knight takes back. And then queen to b6. Now, this is a move that I was dealing with in a lot of my isolated pawn games uh, whenever I was uh, uh, playing against the Tarash. What is white's best move here? Without this game, I would not have known the best way to play against these kind of isolated pawns. What should you play here? Mm, if you think about knight b3, uh-oh, black is able to create a lot of counterplay. And already, computer's giving a better position for black after the move of d4. Um, what else can we play here? Well, we got to do something about the knight, because it's being attacked twice, right? If you play e3 here, 
Well, it's not really in the spirit of the position because now you blocked your bishop from maybe going out to the best squares. This gives about equality for, for white now. Uh, before we had a like a plus one position or being up a pawn already. Knight c2, again the d4 pawn gets pushed. So what's the move here? A lot of people have a hard time. Bishop e3, b2 falls. Don't think they won't take it. Whenever your opponent's in a, in a worse position, they definitely should go pawn hunting because, well, if you're going to be in a bad position, you might as well have some extra material for it, yeah? So here the nice move that white plays here, again, a move I didn't know until I saw this game was to play. Da, 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 da. Knight takes c6 here, and already black is in some trouble. What's black's best move? Well, he has to take back with the with the pawn. Notice that if queen takes c6, we already have one, two, three attackers on this pawn, so black will just lose it. So the only way to try and keep the pawn is to play b takes c6. And this is where the whole game become, uh, start, uh, really starts to uh, flourish, is right now black has what's called the hanging pawns. He had the isolated pawn, which we knew was a was a weakness, and it seems weird to take uh, to give them this pawn to defend now, because now we no longer have the isolated pawn. Well, now we've actually transposed into a different weakness for black, which is called the hanging pawns. This is whenever two pawns together. Just think of it as a hanging pawn. There's just an extra one. They're called hanging pawns, and they both have the same uh, bad design. If either pawn moves forward, the other pawn becomes weak. So if c5 gets played, d5 becomes weak. If d4 gets played, well, now these, this pawn over here is going to have a hard time moving forward. And eventually, at some point, these guys will become stagnant where they can't move forward, and then they become a target. And this is exa exactly what Rubenstein is going to shoot for. Before, uh, before we start going into the attacking these weak pawns, let's go ahead and do first things first. Rubenstein goes ahead and castles. Black plays bishop c e7, getting ready to castle. And now our middle game begins. Here, let's find the critical square or the weak square that we want to control. We need, if we want to do square control here. There's two main squares that I'm looking at. Hopefully you're seeing them. What are the two main ones? Another way to find where the weak squares are is to look where black's biggest weakness is. Where is black's biggest weakness? If you just develop your pieces, you'll probably do okay. But again, you're developing without a plan. I call those lazy moves. You're just kind of moving just to develop. We know developing with a threat is good, but it should probably be the biggest weakness we should develop to attack. So what's the biggest weakness here? Well, hopefully you found it. It's actually the c6 pawn right here. This is a backwards pawn that can't be moved forward without being captured so easily. Wait a second, you said it can't be captured. There's plenty of defenders here. It's White's turn. We know that c5 is the weakness. What do we do here to start grabbing square control and stopping this? White is trying to control the d4 and c5 squares so that these pawns become stagnant pawns and become weak pawns that we can attack. Hopefully you found the move. It's knight to a4, getting a nice tempo off the queen and controlling the c5 square. Um, if you try to do bishop b3, grabbing both at one time, now this is a good idea. Unfortunately, again, queen takes b2 gets played. So one of the nice things about knight e4 getting played is when you attack the queen, you also defend your b2 pawn. Black's queen really doesn't have any good squares to go to. The queen ran to um, b5 here. Let's develop and keep control over c5 and d4. Again, we don't want these pawns to be moved forward. We want to make these pawns stay where they're at so we can attack them. Simple chess. Hopefully you found the move. Bishop to e3. These squares are now ours, and black is going to have a hard time in this game. Black goes ahead and castles. What's the next piece we're going to move? Target the weakness. Of course, it's the c6 pawn is the weakness, so rook c1 is an easy move to find. And now black plays a very good move, bishop g4. This was another problem, another problem I found in the, in the Tarash opening, was this e2 square particular. Because, well, how do you defend it? And seriously, how would you defend this? There's a few different ways to defend this. You have like rook e1, f3, bishop f3, maybe rook c2 or queen d2. Ugh. Well, rook c2 will take out as we just drop the knight. Queen d2 is a way to play. Oh, it doesn't even defend the pawn. What are we doing here? So how do we defend this? Rook e1. If you said rook e1, unfortunately this is not the best. Your rook is way too powerful just to be defending a pawn. Pawn f3. Here you see that, well, it's not really the best because it's going to kill our own bishop, but this is probably the best plan for us for right now. I like this f3 move because this bishop is actually going to be rerouted to another important diagonal. And after you play f3 here, this bishop, where does it move to? There really is no good square for this bishop to move to because there's no targets on the light squares. 
Black went ahead and played. Bishop back to e6. And now let's make sure that c5 can never be played again. Should we play knight a4 or bishop c5 here? Now, to find the right decision here, you have to think which piece is going to be better placed there in the long term. When I think, whenever I talk about that, I'm saying, well, if you play your bishop here, the bishop can trade, so you'll be ended up with a knight. If you play your knight here, the bishop can trade, so you'll be ended up with a bishop. Who do you want to stay there, the bishop or the knight? Hopefully you made the right choice. It's actually the knight we want to keep up. A knight on their side of the board is just going to be the octopus grabbing all these beautiful squares. Yes, your bishop will be nice on the dark squares, but again, what is it really attacking? After the bishop takes, rook moves over, well, I mean, what is your bishop attacking? Nothing, right? So, white played the best move here, bishop c5, rook to e8. One of the best moves about, one of the best ideas about this is that, well, you can't stop the trade here. The dark squares are going to get weak all around on black's uh, queen side. Rook to e8. Of course, we can't just move the bishop because we lose the rook. And now, well, you could trade, but again, there's really no forced move. Where is the bishop going to move to anyways? So, rook to f2 gets played here. This looks like a very weird move. Can you figure out what the idea is? Hopefully you found it. We're trying to attack the weakest pawn, which is the c6 pawn. So the idea is very simple. We're going to be either moving our pawn to e3 or e4, which we will talk about in a second, so that the rook can slide over to c2 to put pressure on the, weak, on the biggest weakness, the c6 pawn. Very nice idea here by Rubenstein. Black played knight d7, attacking the bishop. Well, now we have no choice. We have to go ahead and trade, trade. Black is now prepared to play c5. Again, if he gets c5 in, he can start pushing our pieces backwards. So what do we do here? Another brilliant move by Rubenstein here. Let's develop our last piece and get that square control over c5. Hopefully you find it. The beautiful queen to d4. All the white's pieces are doing a great job uh, with square control, and they're all uh, they're all controlling great and important squares here. Black, on the other hand, is is not is not the case. Um, this rook is kind of randomly placed here. The knight is fighting over c5, so definitely a good knight there. But although it's not really in the center, so it's not best placed here. Uh, what about this queen? The queen's pretty random here. Again, trying to fight over c5, but no. The queen definitely has better squares. This bishop, um, I'm not sure, is this a bishop or is this a pawn? Because you can see here, this would be a nice pawn structure. And the rook's just kind of out there doing nothing. Our knight's controlling c5, the queen's controlling c5, this rook's controlling c5. Although this rook's bad now, he has the plan to go to c2 again, put pressure. And later on, we'll find out where the best place this bishop is going to. I don't want to give away all the answers right now. So black continues, rook to e8. Most likely going to go slide over to c8 to prepare the c5 idea. Um, right now, where should we play our bishop to get more active? Hopefully you found it. It's the only diagonal really that's good. Obviously you can't play the h3 as well. The bishop just takes. So hopefully you found this interesting move, bishop f1. It's always fun whenever you talk to people about this move because it's like, well, where's what's the plan with this bishop? Well, in this game, always think about well, and, and when you're playing a chess game, another good way to think about it is where is your advantage at? I like to think of it in three quadrants. We have the king side, the center, and the queen side, right? In this game, where does white have their advantage? Hopefully you realize it's on the queen side. So the bishop aims over here, the knight's over here, the queen's over here. This is a consistent plan. In particular, the c5 square is on the queen side, so we know we want to attack over here. All the white pieces are attacking. Black kind of has some pieces in the center, and, well, this rook, again, not doing too much in the queen. If No. The main idea here was square control over c5 and d4 to make these pawns backwards pawns and attack them. So white plays bishop f1 with the idea of e3 or e4. Black plays rook to c8, saying, hey, I'm getting ready over here to try and play c5. And now the question is, should we play e3 or e4 here? Now, this is a hard decision for a lot of chess players. What do you think? All right. I know there's quite a few of you that chose this e4 move. Not the best. Why is this the case? Well, think about it. After you play e4 here, there's a few things that you've given to black. One of them is, well, okay, I'll, I'll point out first, yes, either way, e3 or e4 will attack the queen. Black's going to move the queen. But what you're doing here is actually changing your advantage. 
Right now, we've done a lot of work to put pressure on the C6 pawn, which is the, which is the uh, uh, biggest weakness for black, and also square control over C5. If you play your pawn to E4, you're opening up the center, so you're giving black more counterplay. The more counterplay black has, the trickier it's going to get for you. You don't want to help out your opponent this way. And, well, let's just say the queen goes to, I don't know, a5, and after you take and take, well, now notice that weakness that you were fighting over the whole time is now gone. The square control over c5, gone. Here, the isolated pawn is actually a lot easier to defend than the hanging pawns. I actually think the hanging pawns are far weaker than, than the isolated pawn, but I like to play isolated pawns myself because I like, I like to attack. So, eh. So, here, instead of giving your opponent more counterplay, just play the simple move, e3. When you're in a better position, do not allow your opponent counterplay. So, e3 gets played, the pawn's nice and well defended, and we get the tempo off the bishop, um, uh, the bishop gets the tempo off the queen, and the rook is ready to slide over to the c-file. A beautiful positional play here by Rubenstein. Queen goes back to b7. What's the next move we're going to play here? Knight to c5. Be careful if you thought about playing rook or um, if you be careful if you thought about playing this rook to c2 right away. Um, this move is okay, but I definitely like the way Rubenstein plays it by playing the knight to c5 as he gets a tempo and is going to make more and more trades. The more trades, the better, as this pawn will become weak. Also, if you allow your opponent, they may try some tricky stuff like knight b6. Although, again, the knight will be a, um, a monster on the c5 square. So knight c5, um, black goes ahead and just takes. Takes with the c5 rook. You can see this pawn's not going anywhere now. Remember, because we are attacking these pawns in light square, dark square control is very important for us. Oh, rook to c7. Let's continue the attack. Hopefully you see the next move. Rook f to c2. And queen to b6 here. Here black might have an idea about something playing something like a5. Trying to just kind of create counterplay down the b file or a file. Here white says, no, no, no. There's no counterplay here today. What do you play here to get control over the a5 square? C meant control over c5. Pawn to b4. Beautiful move here controlling both of these squares. If you do try to play a5 now, you're in a bit of a uh, ruckus. Um, after this, rook takes a5 idea. Nice tactical concept. If the queen tries to take, we'll take and check first, and then we'll take the pawn back later. Yeah. I mean, uh, pa the pawn will take the queen later. So a very nice tactical defense. That's why it's so important, even if you're a strong positional player, to know your tactics. A lot of times it happens in your positions, you'll get very good winning positions positionally or strategically, but it takes a nice tactical stroke to win it. And this is showing a very nice case of this. You can see that black's pieces are all tied down, just the defense of the pawns. Oof. Again, it, it, in the Tarash, black typically gets a strong attack for the king side, but uh, Ruga's side shows that if you play correctly, maybe this is not the case. So b4 gets played, black plays a6, another very bad idea. Why? Well, you just put another target for your uh, pawn. The bishop's gonna be aiming at it for the rest of the game. Now you need an active defender. But why was a6 played? White had a threat here to win the pawn on c6. What was it? If you played queen c3, that's definitely one of the ideas, although maybe we'll just defend with the rook. We don't want to put our queen on this file to capture. Here the simple idea was to play something like b5. And after the pin here, you see, well, that's just not going to work out too much because you can't take because of the pin. That's why black decided to play a6. Well, let's make b5 another possibility. Let's keep adding pressure in the position. Simple chess. Ooh, rook to a5. A nice little tempo move saying, hey, I don't really mind on trading uh, queens here. Notice that if the queen does trade pawn takes, the pawn structure keeps, white's pawn structure keeps black's pawn structure bad. Eesh. Of course, black doesn't want to go into an end game like this. So black went ahead and played rook to b8. Saying if we do go into uh, end game here, at least my rook gets an active uh, file. Now here is a tricky move for some people. Should we play a3 or take the pawn on a6? Here it wouldn't take a master too long to say, of course we're not going to go ahead and uh, take on a6 because if you take on a6, you're giving your opponent counterplay after queen takes before. Look, c5 is now free and now they're getting counterplay. Maintain. Another thing I like to say is that this is 
the static weakness, a weakness that can't be changed, this pawn will always be weak. After white plays the best move, pawn to a3, a6 is still a target here. Black went ahead and played, rook to a7, and uh-oh, it's tactics time. Remember, you if you're going to be a good positional player, you got to be a good tactical player. White to move and win a pawn. Hopefully you found it. Rook takes on c6. If the queen takes, well, we just take the rook over here, which actually happens in the game. If you don't take, well, I guess you just lose your queen. So, black went ahead and took on c6. Queen takes on a7. And now for the rest of the game, this is just a cleanup job, if you will. Um, White's not going to be allowing any counterplay here. There's probably faster ways to play, but I like the way Rubenstein plays this, just like one of my favorite chess players, Petrosian, not giving any counterplay to your opponent. A lot of times they will just resign as you're, as you're taking the safest precautions to this. Again, don't let your opponent get, create any counterplay. Don't even allow them to check, if possible. Uh, rook to a8. Queen back to c5. This is another nice move. Not letting the queen get to the back rank. Although everything is defended, no counterplay, right? Queen back to b7. Of course, they don't want to trade. King to f2. Just making sure everything's nice and safe. Pawn to h5. A nice idea to maybe create some counterplay over here by messing up the pawn structure. Although Ruben said would probably never take. And also allowing the back rings uh, not to be a problem anymore. Bishop e2, safety first. Pawn g6. Queen d6, putting pressure on the a6 pawn as this is an isolated backwards pawn that white is attacking. Only one move really to defend. Well, bishop c8 was a, was a route, but d5 falls. So queen to c8 gets played again, hoping that maybe I can just jump back here and create some counterplay. And I really like the way white plays this. You could take the pawn a6, but allowing the queen some counterplay, not something you really wanted. Rook c5, attacking the queen. Queen b7, and h4. Just putting your opponent to Zugzwag saying nothing, nothing, nothing. Again, h4 might have been played in the future to create some weaknesses on the king side. Not here for Rubenstein. h4, pawn to a5, and finally black just busts. He's like, I, I, I need counterplay, I need to do something. If uh, And here's the question, should we play b5 or should we take on a5? Rook c7. <laughs> A nice intermezzoa move right there. Of course, we should definitely not take. We're going to be playing b5, but let's get a nice tempo with rook to c7 first. Let's see what happens if you do take if you do take the pawn. If it's either pawn takes or rook takes, is white winning here? Of course. It's just going to make your job a little bit harder because, well, pawns work together best when they're next to each other, right? Whenever you take on c5, or I'm sorry, when you take on a5 with these double pawns, it's really hard to move them forward. Now you're still winning here. Again, you're just making your job a little bit more complicated. So Rubenstein plays it nice and safe. Rook c7 first, queen b8, and then plays pawn to b5. This a5 pawn is still a weak pawn, and now we're going to be getting a protected pass pawn, hopefully, with a4. At that point, going to end games are easily winning. Black knew the best plan of a4, and this would give them that protected pass pawn, and plays a4. But here, hopefully, you know the best plan. What's White's easiest plan for victory here? We've been playing it right now. Pass pawns should be pushed. Here we go, b6, rook a5, b7, rook a7, and hopefully here you can find the last winning tactic in this game. What does White play here? Here, the beautiful, oops, that's not the move. Here, the, mo the beautiful rook to c8 check. What does this move do? The queen attacks on b8, and the rook attacks here too. There's not enough time to stop both threats. Um, so if you try to take with your queen, well, we're more than happy just to go ahead and make a new queen. Bishop takes, we can either do queen d8 check here, or even queen b8, um, just winning more and more material. Um, what else What happens here? What else could happen? Um, if the bishop takes, then the queen's undefended, and we'll just go ahead and take. At this part, this is a very good time to resign. Hope you guys enjoyed this game. Again, this game was about square control and not allowing your opponent counterplay. I'll see you in the next video.